Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is February 16th, 2024, and this video is called God's Prophecy to the Mountains of Israel. After I recorded that short introduction, the Lord spent about an hour with me uh, revealing some things from uh, a couple of scriptures and showed me that I could also name this video cloven by the sword of the spirit cloven by the sword of the spirit remember the cloven tongues of fire in acts chapter 2 what does that represent what is something that's cloven think of the clean animals of uh, the old testament there was a reason why god wanted us to only eat animals that had cloven hooves, and who also chewed the cut. <clears throat> the cloven hoof, a cloven hoof is a divided hoof. We have to, we must rightly divide the word of God. To do that, we have to discern specific things. We have to have a spirit of discernment. The reason why we eat we were called to eat animals that chewed the cut is because we have to meditate on the word. We have to give ourselves to the word. We have to rightly divide the word. And I'm going to go into Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, talking about the uh, sword of the spirit. <clears throat> but I want to go through a couple of... Uh, uh, a little bit of a Greek word study. Uh, I do not, I'm not a Greek scholar or anything, but I can use something like esword and find out what a basic definition of a word is in the Greek. Now, the word cloven in the Greek is the word dia merizo. It means to partition thoroughly, cut it thoroughly, cloven, divide, part. So a cloven hoof is a parted hoof, a divided hoof. It's from the root word merizo, which simply means to cut or to cut asunder. And you'll remember that Jesus uses that word to cut asunder people who do not walk in his ways because he has to cut them uh, apart so that they begin to understand uh, who he is. It is a loving thing that God does. Everything God does for us is loving, even though it's, not, it's always in terms of destruction. And the reason, the reason it's in terms of destruction is because God wants to destroy our self-will. He wants to destroy that part in us which rebels against him and always goes against him. We always lift ourselves up over him, always. We want to be God. That's what this whole, that's what we're learning right now. <clears throat> is that we have a carnal nature. The man of sin resides within each one of us, and we have a responsibility to overcome the carnal man. The carnal man is also the beast. It's the beast within us that rages against God, that always wants to be superior, that always wants to go higher than God and, and wants to argue with God, God, you're not being fair to me. God, why did you do this to me? How, why did you allow this to happen to me? Oh, God, if you were here, I'd tell you. I would tell you. So did Job. That's what Job said. And that was Job's biggest sin, that he raised himself above God. And that's huge. I would um, encourage you to read right now, uh, maybe not now, but later when you have time after this video, read what Elihu says to Job. Uh, I think it's chapters 32 to 37 in the book of Job, right before God speaks to Job. But what Elihu says to Job is amazing. And the root, the root of Job's problem was self-righteousness. He was not, he was not focusing on the utter righteousness and holiness of God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. It means nothing. We only come to God 
through his own righteousness, the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way we get in. <clears throat> so, now that we've talked about clothing, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And I want to just go through that one verse. I'm going to read through the verse and uh, just make a few comments. For the word of God, the word of God, know that the Bible contains the word of God, but that Jesus is the word of God. Jesus spoke through men who wrote it down. But Jesus himself is the word of God. <clears throat> the word of God is living and powerful. It's alive. The King James says it's quick. Well, living I like better. It's living and powerful. Some versions say active, but powerful is better. It's more than active, it's powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So a two-edged sword, you can get it so sharp, it'll be sharp enough to kill you. But the Word of God is sharper. You know, you can make a sword as sharp as you want to even cut like a razor. Piercing even to the dividing asunder the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. There is that idea of cleaving, the cloven hoof. The word of God divides soul and spirit. <clears throat> your soul is your emotions. You're always led. We're all, we're all led by our emotions. The way we feel, that's the way we, we can only do what we feel. If we're sick, a lot of times we can't do anything. Um, if we're depressed, we can't do anything. If you're giddy, you can do stupid things. Our soul is our emotions. But the spirit is our will. We have to learn to exercise our will. And it's the faithful of God the people that Jesus calls the overcomers in the book of Revelation, um, the seven letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, are written to the overcomers. That's who it's written to. Because they're the only ones in the churches who make it. At least who make it for what everybody calls the rapture. Everybody thinks they're going to be in the rapture. <clears throat> no, they're not. Only a few, very few. Only those who have exercised their will in order to obey God, who have walked in the obedience of the faith. Romans 1 verse 5. So the word of God allows us to, well, the word of God divides our soul and our spirit. It divides our emotion from our will, from our ability to choose to do God's will. Because, as Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father doing. I don't do my own will. I didn't come in my own name. I don't come in my own name except for just to tell you who I am. I, I'm not building a ministry. I'm not going to um, have my own college, my own Bible. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to start a denomination. I have no interest at all in anything like that. I only want to do what I see my Father doing. So what he leads me to do, that I'll, I will do, <clears throat> by the grace of God, of course. But he leads me by his grace, and he leads me by his love, and he leads me perfectly in the exact way that he knows I need to go in order to finish the race. He's for me. He's, he wants me to win, and I will win, because he wants me to win, and I understand that, especially now. Um, that last video I did prophecy of Ken Vischer. When I read that two weeks ago or so, I was so sick. I mean, and I think the Lord is going to have me actually show you some pictures soon um, to actually, actually show how sick I have been. And um, it was about six weeks ago when I was just starting to get sicker and sicker, where the Lord said to me, spoke to me and said, show them 
where we are and I show them what can I show them and I had this funny feeling do I have to show them my body and you know what what do you mean show them where we are well that's become um, I think I'm going to have to it's not anything I want to do but it's something some people need to see I think so uh, and no, I'm not going to strip naked here on uh, video. I have a few pictures I will show you that will make it very clear, I think, what I'm talking about. But today is not that day. Anyway, for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, piercing, cutting, even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit. The soul in Greek is the word suke. It deals with our emotions, mainly in our mind, the way we think. That's why we're told to renew our minds, wash ourselves with the word of God, eat the word, read the word to renew your mind. And then the word spirit here is the word pneuma, and that word pneuma means air, breath, or spirit. Then Hebrews 4.12 goes on. So it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the joints and marrow. The joints and marrow. So I was raised by a butcher, and I've cut meat before, and I understand what that means. I've cut between joints and marrow before. <clears throat> I've cooked marrow here in my house for good soup broth. So the Word of God cuts between joints and marrow. Now that's using a natural, something in the natural, to speak of something in the spiritual. Well, what is that talking about? What is what is a joint? A joint is where two bones come together, usually connected with a ligament between them. But then within the bone, you have marrow. So when you cut through a, bo a joint or even through a bone, you will cut through the marrow and you will see this spongy stuff in the middle of the bone. Now, what does that do? That spongy marrow is what makes what creates your blood. Your red and your white blood cells are made by the marrow. Now why is that important? The life is in the blood, the Bible says. Jesus shed his blood for us to ransom us from our divided consciousness. We have a dual nature once we believe in Jesus. We receive the earnest of the Holy Spirit, which the Bible calls, then we have a new man that is like Christ and will not continue to sin unless we just totally shut him out and quit listening to him. We basically cause an abortion when we do that. And we've seen some abortions in what is called the church lately, haven't we? We've seen some serious abortions in the church, the so-called church. <clears throat> so the Word of God divides between joint and marrow. The Word of God cuts your marrow in two because the goal of God now is to take out the bad marrow. What's the bad marrow? The bad marrow is your carnal nature. The bad marrow is the son of perdition. The bad marrow is the man of lawlessness. The bad marrow is the man of sin. The ba bad marrow is the abomination of desolation that stands in our holy place. It stands in our inner man, in our heart. It still defiles our spirit. We can defile our spirit if we do not have clean marrow. So we need the word of God to divide our marrow so that 
the carnal nature will end up we will so that we will totally rule over the carnal nature and live by Christ's nature, which is the spirit nature. Ultimately, there is a time coming when Jesus is going to totally remove the old marrow, the old carnal man, so that we are no longer constantly tempted to sin, so that we can actually walk in righteousness before him. And when he does that, he's going to take out Adam's DNA. Remember, we're, we consist of Adam and Eve's DNA. One side is Adam, one side is Eve. We receive the carnal nature through Adam's DNA, not Eve's, because when our father impregnated Mary, he did it with his DNA and her DNA, not Adam's. So Eve's DNA did not defile Jesus. Jesus had perfect DNA and he had no carnal nature. He did not sin. The man of sin did not reside in him. The man of lawlessness did not reside in him. The son of perdition did not reside in him. The abomination of desolation did not reside in him. And he was not antichrist then, was he? He was Christ. Today, many antichrists have come. Many antichrists are here and they want you to go see them. They want you to go and partake of strange fire. They want you to take your pulpit up to New York and put it before some prophet who can pray over it and give you some of his spirit. I don't want that spirit. That's strange fire. That's demonic spirit. Some people are doing grave soaking, laying on people's graves like false prophet Bob Jones, and they're receiving demonic spirits, not holy spirits. The church has fallen into utter destruction. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 is talking about this. So the word of God divides joints and marrow. This speaks of dividing out the carnal nature of Adam's blood and replacing it with the blood of Jesus. And then the verse goes on. This is a big verse. The word of God discerns, and discern to discern means to judge, to divide between right and wrong. So there's that word divide again, that word cloven, to cleave. The word of God discerns, it judges, it divides the thoughts and the intents of your heart. It divides between the thoughts and intents of your heart. <clears throat> your heart is your inner man, your holy place. Do you accurately discern the thoughts of your heart? You know, everybody does what is right in their own eyes, don't they? That's why everybody has their own truth. There's only one truth. Jesus is the truth. But they don't want Jesus' truth because then they have to change their ways. They want to be able to define their own truth. But once you submit to the Word of God, the Word of God will divide your thoughts and your intents. Okay, you thought to do that. You think that's a good idea, don't you? You think that, oh, that would really be great. Uh, for whatever reason, that, that's a good idea. But what? What really is your intent in doing that? Was the intent really selfish? It was couched in a lot of flowery words and it was couched in a lot of grand statements. Oh, politicians do it all the time, of course, and uh, so do all of the religious leaders and the economic leaders, business leaders. Everybody couches it in these flowery great words. Oh, it's good for you. It, it does this and this. and You really want this, you know. But what is their real intent? See, we need to understand our intent when we do things. Are we doing it in righteousness? Or are we doing it out of selfish ambition, out of desire for lust, out of a desire for uh, making ourselves look great in the eyes of the world? 
Are we doing it because we really love the person we're doing it for? Or are we doing it for show? Are we a hypocrite? So the Word of God divides the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So again, I could have named this video Cloven by the Sword of the Spirit. But we're going beyond that now. I've explained what cloven means and what rightly dividing the Word of God means. And now I want to get into God's prophecy to the mountains of Israel. I want you to read, before we go on, I want you to read all of Ezekiel chapter 36. Read every bit of it and take time. It'll probably take a good hour for you to read it. Pray, pray as you read it. See what the Holy Spirit tells you as you read it. And when I begin again, I am going to begin to explain God's prophecy to the mountains of Israel. This is especially pertinent right now because there is there are heinous things going on over in ancient Israel, among the mountains of Israel, among the, the old literal mountains of ancient Israel right now. This is a prophecy to the, I'll give you a hint, These, this is a prophecy to the spiritual mountains of Israel. This is where the Word of God is living and active. We need to be able to discern what God's talking about in his word. Is he talking about the ancient land or is he talking about something else? Is he talking about the new land of the spirit? See, read the word of God with discernment and rightly divide the word of God. Now, before I go to God's prophecy to the spiritual mountains of Israel, I want to go to Zechariah 14 and just read part of it in order to give you another example of cleaving or dividing something that is very uh, important with respect to the time we live in today. I'm just going to read the first five uh, verses right now. The whole chapter is caught up with this particular vision. Behold, a day is coming for I am, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. They shall not be divided from the city. Then I am will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. Now this may actually be talking about what is possibly going to happen in ancient Jerusalem very shortly. <clears throat> Verse 4. On that day, on, on the day of battle, we are not prepared for the day of battle. I am now prepared for the day of battle, but most people are not prepared for the day of battle. And the pastors of what we call the church did not prepare people for the day of battle. They kept people in delusion and bondage, as we see very well. Verse 4, Zechariah 14, 4 says, On that day, this day of battle, God's feet, I am's feet, shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. So his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is where Jesus prayed right before he was betrayed. The Mount of Olives includes Golgotha, which is the hill of the skull, which is where Jesus was crucified. The Mount of Olives is the mountain upon which Jesus suffered, died, 
and was crucified upon. After he died, remember there was an earthquake that split the rock where he had been crucified. That verse 4 goes on. I'll start at the beginning, though, again. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. From east to west, that means across uh, the, the narrow part of Israel, from, say, the Sea of Galilee over to the Mediterranean Sea, at least, possibly all the way over to the Persian Gulf. So there will be a split in two from east to west, from toward the ancient world of the Persians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians, all the way to the Western world, which is the modern world of the West, the European world, the Western world. So that one half of the Mount, the Mount of Olives, one half moves northward, the other half moves southward. So, God will cleave the Mount of Olives. What does Golgotha really represent? It's the place of the skull where the cross was pounded in. The skull is where our brains are. It's where our minds reside. It represents Armageddon, the battle for the mind. Our minds have to be renewed. Our minds have to be split in two. We have to, our minds have to be freed from the bondage of the world's way of thinking, which is the carnal man, and come into the glorious freedom of the sons of God, which is Jesus's way of thinking. So God is going to cleave the Mount of Olives. He's going to cleave our minds, and he's going to free us from bondage to sin. And he will do that for everyone, but everyone in his own order. Verse 5, And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then... When this happens, when this cleaving occurs, because I believe prophetically what this represents is the glorification of the man-child. When the man-child's carnal man is cloven from him and he becomes a pure, holy, immortal, perfect man like Jesus. That's what this is because look what happens here. In verse 5, <clears throat> Then I am my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. All the holy ones with him. What do they do? What do the holy ones do? Well, go to Deuteronomy 33 first. We'll look at that one. This is the first reference to this event that I can think of. It says this in verse 2, I am came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. Sinai, the giving of the law. Seir is Mount Edom, Esau's land. He shone forth from Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones. He came from the ten thousands of Kodeshim. The Kodeshim, Kodeshim means holy ones. It's a word for the overcomers. Our Bibles use the word saints, a word that has been defiled by the false church. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Flaming fire at his right hand. Yes, he loved his people. All his holy ones were in his hand. The Kodeshim are in God's hands. The Kodeshim are the fire of God. The Kodeshim are the lake of fire. The lake of fire is what will purge the dross from everyone who did not follow God 
by exercising their own self-will. Instead, they followed the son of perdition into lawlessness. They did not overcome the mark of the beast. They did not overcome the carnal nature. So God first then is going to raise up his holy ones who will purge them with a spirit of burning, which is the lake of fire, who can dwell with consuming fire, Isaiah asks in chapter 33. Only those who want righteousness. See, if you don't want righteousness, if you don't love the holiness of God, you cannot dwell with consuming fire. Do you dwell with consuming fire? This is what this is talking about, see? Look, verse 2, Deuteronomy 33, 2, God, I am, came from ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Verse 3, yes, he loved his people. All his holy ones were in his hand. Well, put the two verses together. That's flaming fire in his hand, and that flaming fire is the holy ones, the Kodeshim, the overcomers, the man-child. Now let's go to Jude, because Jude deals with the situation in the church we have now of the catastrophic failure of IHOP, International House of Prayer, the catastrophic deceptions of Mike Bickle and all those that worked with him for many, many years, pastors who worked and exulted in his persona for decades, never discerning what kind of man he was. Never, they have responsibility, brothers. Believe me, they have responsibility. A lot of them are trying to wash their hands of it now, but no, they're responsible. They got a lot of good things when they were there under his limelight, and they have a lot of repenting to do. So the next um, verse, well, <clears throat> go to the book of Jude. Jude totally deals with the situation in IHOP and the other uh, corrupted churches in the world. All of them, virtually all are corrupted. <clears throat> but I want to, I'm not going to go through this. I did it uh, several videos, videos ago when uh, the news about Mike Bickle and IHOP came out. You can find it on my channel here. Now, verse 14 of Jude says this. Now, he's talking about these blasphemers that rule what we see as the church today. He's talking about the false prophets, the false Christs. And then he says this. It was about these people, these evildoers, these corrupted religious leaders. It's about these people that Jude is talking about. Verse 14, it was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, I am comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. Well, isn't that interesting? He came with ten thousands of holy ones in Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. This is the same group, people. It's the very same group. Why did he come? Why, why did the Lord come with them? Verse 15, in order to execute judgment on all, all, and to convict all, all, every person on earth, of all, uh, to convict all the ungodly, of all their deeds of ungodliness. The church has a form of godliness, but they are ungodly. They are unholy. They seduce women and many other evil, evil things. So these holy ones, these ten thousands of Kodeshim, are coming to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, three times, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners, four times, have spoken against him. Against who? The Lord. Against Christ. Ungodly sinners who rule our churches speak against Christ. They deny Christ. They do not speak in conformity with the word of Christ. They deny Christ. They are antichrists in 
what you call the church and where you go to church. These people, these people that Enoch's talking about, are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They focus only on their carnal nature. They do not submit to the Holy Spirit within them to put down the carnal nature. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Oh, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Have you heard any stories about that? <clears throat> Jude nails it. This is what Zechariah is talking about. This cleaving of the Mount of Olives. This taking away of the carnal nature from the Kodeshim so that the Kodeshim become perfect. They then will come and they will bring this world back into order. And in doing that, their job as the lake of fire will be to convict all of these ungodly sinners of all the ungodly things they did all their life. And how the entire world has become corrupted by them and others that do exactly the same thing. Even people who, who overtly call themselves Satanists and do overt public satanic sacrifices like you know who that was so popular during the Super Bowl. I'm going to end today's video here and the next one will be God's prophecy to the mountains of Israel.